Uh, it's a little bit difficult for me to believe that we've already come to the end of the summer. Of course, it's Labor Day weekend, and that's kind of the official end of the summer. Uh, I think you would agree, we have been blessed this summer in particular. I, I mentioned a moment ago our church has been blessed, but let me tell you what God has done in the months of June, July, and August. Uh, just over these last three months, do you know that across our campuses, we have baptized 33 people just in three months who have come to faith in Christ or who have made their faith in Jesus public. And you should never, ever get used to that. You should never lose the wonder of that fact that we are seeing people come to faith and make their faith public. And so we praise God for that. We've also, over the course of these three months, mobilized, prayed for, funded, and sent out four different mission teams this summer who have gone across the country and around the world. And in every instance, on all four of those mission trips, they have communicated the gospel And lives have been changed because in those places where they've gone, people have come to know the Lord Jesus. And then we've also grown spiritually, not just numerically. I mentioned baptisms and salvations. We've also had people join our church. I don't even know the exact number, but it's several dozen families that have actually become members of Brookstone over these last three months. While all of that is wonderful... The thing that I really am a little more excited about than that is the fact that we have grown spiritually over these summer months as well. You know, we emphasized in the month of June growing in his likeness as it relates to generosity. Remember we talked about that every other month we're going to emphasize a specific character trait of our Lord. And in June we talked about the fact that God is generous. And because God is generous, we want to be generous And we grew in generosity as a church. Many of us took steps, major steps forward in our decision to be a generous family or a generous person. And we're learning stewardship out of that. In the month of August, we emphasized his faithfulness. And we've grown in faithfulness over these months as well. And of course, as we've been studying the book of Ephesians, we've also grown in Christian unity. This has been a a summer where we have been learning together and thinking every single Sunday morning about the joy and the responsibility of Christian unity. And we have become more than we've ever been. And Brookstone, by God's grace, has always been known as a unified church, a, a place of deep love and unity. Uh, as a church. That's, that's just been something God has done over the decades. But really more than ever now, we have experienced this singleness of heart, the singleness of purpose, this, this unity that the Holy Spirit is producing within us. And I have to tell you, it has been so wonderful for me in the midst of a culture that is maybe more divided than it's ever been in my lifetime. And maybe you would agree with that, that that there's chaos and there's division and there's contention in the culture. And living in that midst of all of that and hearing all of that all the time and seeing that streaming across social media and in the newscasts all the time, it's just so wonderful to lean into our church family and just say, praise God, we're one in this place. And thank the Lord for the unity that he's, that he's given us. And we've really been growing in that unity over the course of these 13 or 14 weeks together. Now, specifically, over the last few weeks, three or four weeks, as you know, we have been drilling down into chapters 5 and 6 of Ephesians where we've been learning some really practical unity lessons. That is, how do I, how do I live with unity in the, in the environments, the relationships that matter the most. We've talked about walking in wisdom and walking in love and walking in the light. Um, we've, we've talked about how to build unity in our marriage, building love and respect in our, in our homes. Uh, last week, we talked about raising children, parenting, and changing the way that we view parenting, not just as a task, get these kids raised. 18 summers are going quickly. I need to grab all I can with the kids and enjoy these moments. Yeah, all of that's true. But more than that, we need to see our parenting as an act of worship, that we're raising these children back to the Lord. 
I have to tell you, I got a text about midweek this week from, from someone who said to me, it's been a tough day parenting and I'm trying to do it as worship, but it's hard today. And I know sometimes it is hard to see parenting as an act of worship. We learned that last week, that we ought to think about parenting as worship. Now, last week we read in the text verses 5 through 9 of chapter 6, But we ran out of time, and I told you we would begin there this week because we weren't able to to think about these verses uh, last Sunday. So let me just talk about them quickly. Jot this down somewhere. Remember last week we talked about the fact that Jesus is Lord at home and at work? And if I'm going to change my view of marriage and, and parenting to be a worship perspective, then I need to do the same thing at work, and that is that I need to begin to see my work as worship. It's important that when we read what Paul says about employees and employers, that we learn that he's teaching us to view our work as worship. You might be surprised that the Bible would speak to us about the mundane function or task of our job, our work, but it does, not only in Ephesians, but in other places as well. In Ephesians, Paul speaks of servants and masters. You have to understand, he didn't live in in an employee-employer culture. He lived in a master-slave culture. So in chapter 6 and verse number 5, he says, Servants, be obedient to your masters. And in verse number 9, he says, And you masters, don't threaten your servants, but you be kind to them as well. It doesn't matter, though, that the culture is different. The principles apply just as surely. Just change the word servants to employees and change the word masters to managers or business owner or shift leader, those who lead on the job and those who are being led on the job. In either case, the Bible tells us how we are to function. And it tells us that our work is to be a function of worship. In verse number five of chapter six, servants, obey them that are your masters, employees, and obey your employers according to the flesh. Do so with respect, fear and trembling, in singleness of heart as unto Christ. Now, let me just read that again. Here's what it says. It says, when you go to work, you follow the the leadership of your employer just like you follow Jesus. That's what as unto the Lord means. In the same way that you would obey Jesus, obey your employers. Now, of course, that's unless your employer is asking you to do something that would put you in defiance of the commands of Jesus. But all things being normal, and that's not typically the case, we ought to obey those who have leadership over us in, in, our, in our jobs. He said, you do this as unto the Lord. Why? Verse 6, because you are the servants of Christ. Don't obey them only when they're watching by eye service as men pleasers, but obey them because you are the servants of Christ. You are doing the will of God when you do your job rightly, when you do it obeying those who lead you at work. You're being a servant of Christ. Look at what he says in verse 7. Oh, by the way, verse 6, don't do it without service. That means don't do it only when they're watching. Come on, employees, listen. It means that I'm not a hard worker, a faithful employee. I'm arriving on time and, and working a full day only when I'm being watched. But when the boss is gone, I'm just uh, flittering my time away and wasting time and not working hard. No, no, he said, don't do that. You're serving the Lord, and the Lord's always looking, whether the boss is watching or not, right? So he says, do your job as unto the Lord, not as a man pleaser. Verse number seven, you're doing the will of God with goodwill, doing this service as to the Lord. Verse eight, knowing that whatever you do as to the Lord, God will reward you. You say, well, why would I be a faithful employee? My employer is is, is not a very nice person. My employer is demanding and they're demeaning and they're, they're hard to work for. I get it. Sometimes it is hard. But you serve Christ. And as you're serving Christ on that job, then he will reward you. This is what verse 8 promises. He will reward you for your faithfulness. And then verse 9 speaks to employees or owners or shift managers or whomever. Those who are giving leadership. He says, you do the same. You be faithful. You be kind. You be, you be a servant of the Lord Don't threaten 
knowing that you have a master which is in heaven as well. So let me give you a challenge. All of you who will go to work this week, and, and most all of us will. I know some, some are self-employed, some work for others, whatever. But wherever you go to work this week, let me give you a challenge. Read before you go to work. Take a week, maybe two, maybe it'll take a month. But every morning, here's my challenge, before you go to, to your job, read Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. Just read these five verses. And pray these back to the Lord and say, Lord, help me that I will be the servant of Christ on the job today and that I'll represent you well, be faithful in this task, and Lord, I'm trusting you as I do this. And if you'll do that, it may not change anything on your job, but it will change your, your view of your job and your work will begin to become worship to the Lord. And God will let you be a light as you do that. All right. Well, that's the last part of the sermon I didn't get to last week. But today, we're going to complete chapter number 6 as we begin in verse 10. By the way, before we read this passage, this is a good opportunity since I'm telling you that we're concluding this Ephesians teaching today. Let me tell you where we're going beginning next Sunday. Um, some of you will remember that uh, Matthew records and Luke records um, where Jesus is asked a question by a lawyer one day where he's asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? Do you remember this, this question? Master, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And he says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. Remember the second commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. And Luke records what I don't think Matthew does. Luke says there was a lawyer standing there who said because he wanted to justify himself, who is my neighbor? If I'm to love my neighbor as myself, who is that that I am supposed to love? And on that question, we are going to spend the next seven Sundays, beginning next Sunday, thinking about how we can love like Jesus. And I want you to be here because here's what we're going to do. Over seven Sundays, we are going to think about seven specific actual people, kinds of people or people groups that we have been commanded to love and to love them like Jesus loves them. And we're going to talk about how it is that we can do that. And we're going to give you, I promise you, every single Sunday for the next seven, we are going to offer to you very tangible ways that you can begin to show love to these groups of people. And so I hope you'll be here for these seven weeks that we'll launch into this series, Love Like Jesus, next Sunday. Today, though, we are, by God's grace, going to complete Ephesians chapter number 6. And so follow along as I read, beginning in verse number 10. Verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Do me a favor. Maybe make sure you're awake. Tell your neighbor right now to be strong. Just turn to him and tell him, be strong. Some of you pointed your finger. I saw you. Be strong. Here's, here's Paul's concluding admonition to these Ephesian believers. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. In high places. Wherefore, because that's the battle, you must take unto you the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching unto that prayer, being faithful in that prayer with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. 
that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you also may know my affairs and how I'm doing. Tychicus, or Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be unto the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and all God's people said out loud together, amen, amen. I love these concluding verses of this letter to the Ephesian believers. They read to me, Rather like the dying words that a father might speak at the end of his life to his children. They, they have that feel to me. You know, I, I would sort of say with Paul, if, if I had one more conversation to have with you, what would I say to you? If I had one more opportunity to influence you in some way, what were the things what would the things be that i would want to talk to you about in in my context with you as a church family if i knew that this today was my very last opportunity to stand and preach god's word to you what would i say if i knew that it was my last opportunity to preach one day that day will come and we don't always know we can't always plan when it will be. But if I knew that this was my last opportunity, I really think that this would be my message. The same things that Paul is saying, I think would be the things that I would say. He says three things in these verses that we've read. He says, stand firm. I think that I would say that. If I knew this was the last time I would talk to you, I would say, church, stand firm for Jesus. And I think I would say to you, be bold. Be bold in your witness. Be bold in your your sharing the love of Christ. Stand firm and be bold. I really think I would say those two things. And in fact, I think that I would have said those two things to you a decade ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. I think all those years ago, that would have been my message had I known it was my last. Stand firm and be bold. Over more recent years as I've gotten older, I think God has shown me the value of love sincerely. That's the third thing Paul says. And I think I would say that now as well. In youthful zeal, I mean, for years I would have said, stand firm and be bold. But now I think I've kind of learned to say, look, it's important as well that we would love sincerely. These are the three admonitions that Paul gives to his friends in Ephesus. Be bold, stand firm, and love deeply. And so let's talk about that this morning. Would you jot down somewhere in your notes Paul's instruction, his encouragement to them to stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. Four times in verses 11, 13, and 14. Four different times Paul says, stand. Let me show them to you. Look at verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. In verse number 13, wherefore, take unto the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Same root word, same idea. Stand firm. In verse number 13, withstand, it's, it has the idea of standing but pushing against opposing forces. Withstand. At the end of verse number 13, he says, and having done all, just stand. And then again in verse number 14, He says, stand therefore. The word means to take a position, to to put your feet down and hold that position, to take some territory and say, this is my stand. It It was near the end of World War II. In fact, it was in February of 1945, the closing months of World War II, that the Allied forces needed to take a tiny volcanic island in the Pacific called Iwo Jima. They needed an airstrip 
in the Pacific. And the Japanese were entrenched on Iwo Jima. And so the United States Marines, hurrah, were commissioned, were charged to go on to Iwo Jima to defeat the enemy and to take that island uh, uh, as, as U.S. territory. And it was fierce fighting. If you read the stories of it, several weeks passed, days upon days of intense fighting to take it. But finally, they were able to conquer that volcanic little island. And several soldiers, Marines, made it to the top of that island and they raised the American flag, which inspired all of the other soldiers down at the base of the island. And that memorial, you've all seen it. You've, you've been to D.C., many of you have, and seen it. And that Iwo Jima memorial is a reminder of the victory that can be had when we are willing to fight and stand. And listen to me carefully. Here's what Paul is saying to us. Raise the flag of Jesus over your life. Raise the banner of Jesus. Put your feet steady and say, I will stand for Jesus Christ. I'm going to win the victory. I'm going to stand for him. This is what we are called to, to take a stand. However, Paul is very honest in chapter 6 to tell us that taking such a stand will not come without a fight. He reminds us in this passage that the struggle is real, that all of us share in a spiritual battle, in a spiritual struggle. He tells us in verse number 12 that we wrestle. Do you see that, verse number 12? He says, for we uh, wrestle, and we always read that verse and we move right on past that word and we say, not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and we get into that. But I want you to think about the word wrestle for a minute. The word means a struggle where one opponent seeks the utter absolute defeat of his of the, of the opponent that he's struggling with. It's sort of the idea of a wrestling match where in, in our day, in high school wrestling, you would have two teenage guys going at it and when one gets the other pinned, then you have a referee who's on the mat ready to slap the mat and call the match. And that's where it ends and everybody stands up and everybody's safe. In Paul's day, when he's thinking about wrestling, it wasn't that way. Because the way those contests would end would often be with death. The word literally means that the victor wins by putting his hand or his foot on the throat of his opponent. And what Paul is saying is that you and I need to take a stand for Jesus, but we must know that we have an enemy who is fighting against us and who wants nothing short of our destruction and the diminishing of the glory of Jesus in our lives. Now, verse 12, we struggle like this. We wrestle, but it's not with flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities. It's not flesh and blood. It's not people. Listen to me, loved ones. Whatever struggle you're having, whatever, wherever there's relational struggle or hardship, maybe it's at home or at work or in a friendship or maybe even a church relationship, listen, that person is not your enemy. They're not. They may be being used by your enemy, but they're not your enemy. Ultimately, the enemy is described in verse number 12 and 13. It's principalities. It's powers. It's rulers of darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. What, what Paul is telling us is that there are spiritual forces that are arrayed against God's people. I don't have time to unpack what each of these four descriptors mean, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness. But suffice it to say that these descriptors speak of the, the array of the enemy that is positioned against and opposing your taking a stand for Jesus in your life, in your home, in your church. They are, a, they are arrayed against us. They're powerful, they're organized, they are vicious, and they are relentless. He tells us that these forces operate in darkness, that their aim is wickedness, 
Verse 16 says they have fiery darts that they cast toward us, darts of discouragement and darts of temptation and darts of deception and darts of division. But this is their aim. It is to attack the glory of Jesus in your life, in your family, in our church. And we must know that while we have been called to stand, that the struggle is real and we will face this opposition. In fact, let me just quickly, would you mind to turn over to 1 Peter? I think it's worth the time that it'll take us. Just go a few pages forward. 1 Peter chapter 5. And if you don't know where it is, just go toward Revelation. It's right near the back of your Bible. It's 1 Peter. It's right in front of 2 Peter. Does that help you? 2 Peter follows 1 Peter. You'll find it right after Hebrews and James, just in front of the book of Revelation. I want you to see it and mark it in your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Here's what Peter says. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, this is, this is the leader of these principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is on the prowl, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. This is your spiritual enemy. That he wants nothing short of devouring your spiritual life. And if he can, devouring your life in totality. And by the way, we should acknowledge, shouldn't we, Peter... When Peter wrote this, he knew what he was talking about because Peter had experienced spiritual warfare. Do you remember when Jesus said to Peter, he said, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And Simon Peter's life was sifted and he had a great failure in his spiritual warfare. You know how that he denied even knowing Jesus three times on the night that Jesus was arrested. He was in the throes of this battle. And on that particular night, he lost the battle. So when he writes, be sober, be vigilant, he's coming to get you, this spiritual enemy is. He knows what he's talking about. Now, I, I can't read this passage and end with verse number eight because Look at what 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9 says. It says, Whom resist, speaking of Satan, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You're not alone in this. Look at verse 10. But the God of all grace. He's talking about spiritual battles. And then he says, But God has grace. I can't read that without thinking of John 21. We're on the beach after Jesus' resurrection. The risen Lord sits down for the first time with the denier, Peter. And he says to Peter in the presence of the other disciples, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And in so doing, he restored Peter, giving Peter the chance to no longer say, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. But now Peter says, I love you, Lord. Lord, you know I love you. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus said, you're not used goods. Go feed my sheep. When Peter says in verse 10, verse 8, you have an enemy. It's a battle. But in verse 10, there is a God of all grace who even when we fail in the battle, he is the God of all grace who restores us, verse 10, but the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered for a while, he will make you perfect. He'll, he'll complete his work in you. He will establish and strengthen and settle you. I love this. Peter is saying, even when you fail in the battle, there's a God of grace who will work in you. The, the call that he has put on your life for his glory remains even through our failures. Verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The point is, Peter knew something about this battle. Well, Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 says that we ought to, we ought to recognize that the, the struggle is real. The battle is an actual spiritual battle. But we can also know, back in Ephesians chapter number 6, that the sovereign Lord reigns. And so even though the battle is real, Jot this down. We should remember that the Lord is mighty. Come on, somebody. Somebody say amen right there. The Lord 
is my, yes, there's a spiritual enemy. Yes, there's a, 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 an adversary like a roaring lion. You better believe there's spiritual wickedness and, and, and rulers of darkness and principalities and powers. And, there, and you may read all of that and say, and I'm just little old me. How can I win a battle in such a spiritual warfare? Here's why. Because the Lord is mighty and our victory is in him. That's why we can win the battle, because the Lord is mighty. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, John writes, speaking of spiritual warfare, John writes, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, and he can give you the victory. In verse number 10 of Ephesians 6, Paul says, remember that the Lord is mighty and be strong. Look at it, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. So he, he's warning us that the battle is real. We're going to face spiritual warfare. But our duty is to be strong. But when we face such a formidable enemy as we do, we must be willing to admit our weakness and vulnerability while at the same time we commit our weakness into the strength of him who is stronger than all and above all for all time. We put our confidence in the Lord who is mighty. Be strong. He says, that's your duty, but don't be strong in yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Well, how do we do that? How can I go out into this world, raise my family, um, live with my spouse, go to work every day as an act of worship? How can I do that facing spiritual battle in the strength of the Lord? Let me suggest two ways that Paul has suggested earlier in Ephesians, one is that we should pray, we should pray for spiritual power. If I'm going to be strong in the Lord, I need to ask the Lord who is powerful to give me his strength. And this is what Paul does in Ephesians 3.16. He prays for spiritual strength. He says that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. How am I going to win this battle? I've got to call out to Jesus. I need to pray for spiritual strength not depending on myself. And then, secondly, how do we appropriate or access this spiritual strength? We pray for it. Number two, we welcome the Holy Spirit's work within. I want you to hear me very, very carefully. You cannot win in this life. You cannot win this spiritual battle and have the victory. You, you will fail in taking your stand if you do it in the energy of the flesh, in the hope of your religious activity, in the commitment of your church participation. You will fail. But if you will ask the Lord to strengthen you in the inner man, and if you will welcome the Holy Spirit to do his work within you, you will stand. Doesn't mean you'll never thump, stumble or fail, but you will stand in your life for Jesus. Look at chapter 3 and verse number 18, where Paul reminds us in that verse that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby we have been sealed to the day of redemption. Rather than resisting the Holy Spirit, we ought to be welcoming the Holy Spirit's work. That's how we stand strong in the Lord. And then the third thing that he says here about this battle is just that we should be reminded that the armor, he's given us what we need, the armor is complete. And you'll see this in verses 14 to 18. We have been given, God has given us resource to win this battle, to stand for the Lord. And verses 14 through 18 talk to us about these six pieces of, of spiritual armor. Um, he says that we ought to put on the whole armor of God and that we do that by, um, by taking up the shield of faith and putting on the, the breastplate of righteousness and, and having our loins girt with the truth. Six different parts of that armor which will allow us to stand. Now, I don't have time to talk about those six pieces. No way we could do that today. But let me recommend a resource to you. If you'll go to our website, in March and April of 2022, we did a series called The Armor of God. It's on our website. It's, it's there, video, audio, whatever you want. Um, and it's six weeks dealing with six pieces of armor. We gave an entire Sunday morning to each individual piece of that armor. And so if you want to get that resource that's available, you just go online and watch it. And, um, and that will be helpful to you. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The second thing he says is to be bold for the Lord. This is verses 19 and 20. Be bold for the Lord. He says, pray for me, verse 19, that, I will, that God will give me grace to speak. I'll, give, I'll have utterance. I'll open my mouth boldly. 
for which I'm an ambassador in the bonds. I'm an ambassador in bonds uh, for, the, for the gospel. I, I told you at the beginning of the series that Paul wrote this letter from uh, a Roman prison. And yet, he still wants to be bold in his faith. How inspiring that would have been to the Ephesian believers. They're concerned about Paul in, in jail, and he's writing to them saying, pray that I'll be a witness while I'm here, chained to these guards. How they must have known I need to be a witness too. And how we ought to know that, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think verse 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though Christ did speak to you through us to be reconciled. We are ambassadors, and we're not in bonds for it. We're not going to jail for it. And we ought to be fervent, be bold in our speaking for the Lord. Lastly, he says that we ought to love deeply like the Lord. I love the intimacy of the last few verses, verses 21 down through verse number 24, where Paul just demonstrates his love for these Ephesian believers by saying to them, I know you're concerned about me, and I've sent Tychicus to you that he could let you know how I'm doing. I'm doing okay, and I know your heart will be comforted. He's, he loves them, and he knows that they love him, and he wants to communicate to them that he's doing well. He sends this partner of his, this fellow servant he's called uh, in, in these verses, to go and report on his well-being to these Ephesian believers. And then he closes his letter by saying, verse 23, Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God, from the Father, God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I love verse 24, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus with sincerity. Amen. Paul concludes by saying, I want you to love one another. I want you to love the Lord. I want you to stand in his strength and determine that even though there's a battle, you will stand by the grace of God. If this was my last message to you ever, I just realized that's like the third time I've said that. I hope there's not something prophetic in that. (laughs) But if this were my last message to you ever, I think I would say to you, be bold. Be strong, love deeply, and let's stand for Jesus until he comes. 